What's up, everybody? I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports. Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. Today, we have Joe Markovsky, who is the CEO of DAZN North America. You've heard of DAZN. It's where we're streaming a lot of our boxing fights, soccer matches. You know, they have international rights to the NFL. They're all over the place. They're all in on the streaming model. They're really trying to usurp linear television. And Joe has a lot to say about that. You know, he has a really interesting story. He was born over in London. Now he's in New York. He's rose through the ranks of the company. And whether that's the technology aspect of streaming, the consumer habits, or just where he thinks culture is going, how he thinks women's sports is going to evolve, what he thinks of the state of boxing, he's... Uh, a lot of interesting thoughts, insights, and he's right in the driver's seat for one of the leading companies who was responsible for bringing us all of this content. So it's a nice, long, deep conversation. I don't want to keep you waiting because we have a lot to talk about. We're going to go and hear from our partners at Oracle NetSuite real quick, and then we will be right back with Joe. 2000, 2008, 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you had the dot-com crash, then the housing crash, then whatever roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it is a dangerous time not to know your numbers. But over 31,000 businesses don't really have that problem because they have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control over your financials, inventory, planning, and budgeting that you have been seeking. You can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, improve your margins. When you have uncertain times, the answer is very simple. NetSuite, you can identify rising costs, automate your business processes, easily see where to save money. 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and their control when they upgrade it to NetSuite. Those are pretty good numbers. So what are you waiting for? Right now, it's extra easy because NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you got to do is head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Go there right now, netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Check it out while you're listening to the episode. This is going to help you take your business to the next level. I'll be waiting to hear what you think. Joe, what is up, my man? Welcome to the pod. Good to see you, Ernest. How's everything going? Oh man, it's going pretty good. You know, trying to trying to close out 2022 strong. I know you probably feel the same way over there. Uh, for sure, yeah. I mean, the last time I saw you was in slightly less um, calm circumstances in the in the press conference environment of a big Vegas fight week. So it's nice to see you in a bit more of a a normal environment. I'm glad to hear you're doing well. This is who we really are. I um I did I did get to see you in probably what is like you know a comfortable element for you. I know it's a lot of hard work, but you were fully on your like CEO swag. Like you know I don't I'm not gonna I don't want to gas you too much, but but respect as well. It's like I I see you there. You're running around. It's a total circus in Vegas, and I thought you know from being there for the listeners who don't know, this was the Canelo Gennady fight. Uh, you all ran a really tight ship, and I just, you know, I admired your own resolve during it. Um, and, yeah, I, I think it's been really cool what DAZN has been doing overall. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was great to see you out there. Um, I think, you know, when ducks are on water and they look calm, their legs are moving very fast beneath the surface. It's a little bit like that in a, in a major fight week. Um, the, the, you know, boxing, it's interesting Boxing is obviously a big part of our of our North American business, a big part of our global business. Um, it, it, every single event is its own thing. You, you're not rinsing and repeating uh, much in a, in a in a boxing promotion. There's 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 so many different things and different considerations each time. So um, although the venue is often the same, what you're dealing with and what you're uh, what you're focused on week to week in, in Vegas, fight week to fight week is is often very different. Um, I personally try, and especially in Vegas, which is a strange place. I mean, I enjoy going there, but it's it's an odd it's an odd place. It's surreal, to be. I, and and you probably have been there. Like everyone says, do two max three days in Vegas. But I'm sure work has had you there for long stretches where you're like, what am I doing? For sure, but the, the, it sends me the other way. I think some people, when you first go to Vegas, and I definitely did this, I don't know, eight or nine years ago on my first trip to Las Vegas for work, you get sort of in awe of the place, and you're excited to be there, and you want to run around doing all of it. And, you're there to do a job, but you've got the casinos and the nightclubs and the restaurants and all of it. And you're never, never really quite sure what time of day it is because uh, that's what Vegas wants you to, to think. Mm -hmm. um, I'd go the other way now. I just avoid all of it. I just, if I'm not needing to be somewhere for work, I'm in my room or 
trying to find, you know, it's easier said than done. Getting outside in Vegas and finding a place to sit in the quiet is is hard. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's an amazing place. But one, if you're there for work, you need to you need to temper your behavior a little bit. Yeah, no, they um they kind of like trap you in that environment on purpose, and the for casinos sure. are just. You know, the amount of work it takes to walk through the MGM or through Caesars to get where you're mm. going is a lot. I I really um, relate to what you said because, let's see, I first went out to Vegas maybe around a decade ago, right? I'm early 20s. I'm fresh in my career. And it's my first mm. time. So all you have is the lore of Vegas. And, mm. and I took advantage of it. I had some fun. Um, yeah, now, sure. though, I've been several, several times in just the past few years, especially working in sports. And I can confidently say um not because i'm just trying to be like you know mr goody two shoes you know i look i have my fun in the right circumstances but i haven't drank on any of those trips i haven't really like party and not because i was trying to reel myself in so much but you just you grow up you have a job to do mm-hmm. and um i one thing i love seeing the side of that city that's like it's business it's where it's like the there's a yeah. party it's element a very but well that's, run business it's a very exactly well run you know you got vegas is. out yeah. there now you got or not Vegas. you got formula one out there now mm. uh you know the grand prix coming seeing how you all ran the fight and, and probably will continue to over the years coming but it's um it's good i always love hearing you know perspective like that from people because yeah. i feel like the, the, these are the musings of two men in their thirties who've probably lost the ability to go out party and then do a good job at work the next day. I think many of your listeners are probably still in that phase of their life where they can go out, do whatever they want until 4am and then they can be up and at them looking fresh, feeling fresh at 9am. I no longer have that ability, unfortunately. So and I can't believe I, I ever had I wanted it. To. I yeah, can't I believe I ever had it, man, dude, you remember, I don't know, maybe we're both, like you said, the two thirty somethings, we've been somewhat ambitious and we've done a lot of stuff in the past decade, I would like almost be proud of all nighters. I'd be like, yeah, I pulled an all nighter. Now I'm at the office. I came straight from the party to the office. Like those days are so done. And if I ever <laughs> wind up in a situation that calls for it, like the only all nighters I've pulled is because I was writing all night. I had to file yeah. something, whatever. And I'm done. I'm out of commission. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta grow up at some point. I'm I'm getting nervous midweek if I'm not brushing my teeth before 9.30. I'm in that phase of my life now where I want to be in bed and asleep before 10. So, yeah, I get it. But look, Vegas is um, it's a fantastic place to to stage big events. Clearly, you know, it's a, it's a, for fans, which is ultimately why it's staged there. It's a great treat to go to a big fight in Vegas. I've got friends who've, who've come to some of our shows from the UK or um, elsewhere and have, have just the, the, the sort of glamour and the excitement around a big weekend a big fight weekend in vegas definitely carries through and that extends beyond hardcore boxing fans it, it, it's a big vegas fight night a canelo fight night you know de la hoya fight night previously and anthony joshua fight night in the uk these are iconic moments they're iconic sports events and um, vegas adds i think to all of all of that um and i think people you know people want to come and do the whole Vegas experience and it's great. It's great to see them enjoy themselves when you do it too often, you know, you need to rein it back. So we're both, we're both there now. Yeah, totally. The, the spectacle is part of the experience, mm. but while we're, while we're talking about cities and, you know, differences between different communities. So you are a CEO of the zone North America. And mm. I know this positioning, you know, you've been at the almost going on eight years um, mm. and you were in London. I know you're from mm. the UK. Um, mm-hmm. I believe that your work took you to Tokyo at some point. Uh, now you're in New York City. You've been there for mm-hmm. the past, you know, handful of years. Um, especially for a brand that's as globally focused as his own. Like, what have you gleaned <clears throat> from this experience in all like some of the greatest cities in the world? Yeah. Look, first of all, on on a personal level, I feel extremely privileged to have lived in. Obviously, being born in London, London's a great city. Um, my home my family and friends, most of my friends are still in and around London. Great place to be from. Very lucky to have been born there. Um, my, my journey with DAZN actually started before DAZN was DAZN. DAZN came out of a business called Perform Group, which uh, is no longer one thing. It's been it's been split up and sold in different ways now, but it was a B2B sports media business. What that means is it was doing a lot of the things behind the scenes that was fueling 
um, sports brands, bookmakers, betting companies, uh, the websites of clubs, of leagues, uh, on a global scale, based out of London, with offices in various parts of the world, including here in New York. Uh, and I joined that business uh, as an account manager um, out of college 11 years ago. And um, it was a fantastic place to start your career. Clearly, sport is a great sort of subject matter to, to work in. I think all of your listeners are in and around the sports industry or the industries around sport. Um, just a great opportunity to spend your days working on stuff that you were interested in. And whilst a lot of my friends were going into the city and going into law firms and banks and marketing agencies and, you know, making their own ways in different, way, in, in different ways, uh, I felt very privileged to be focused on something in my personal life that I was extremely passionate about, which is sport. And learned about the business of sport and gradually, as I'm sure all of us do in the early couple of years of our career, you start trying to piece together how the whole thing works and who does what and how it pieces together. Um, I feel actually for, for younger people now, because so much of that is, is being in the office around people that you, um, you learn from, you pick up on bits of information, you overhear conversations, you're learning silently in meetings. And I hope that obviously people get back into offices regularly enough to allow that to continue happening. But that, that was the early phase of my career. I was lucky enough with, with the business to, uh, to go through a, a, a business school part-time in London at Imperial College, which is a great university, did a, an MBA uh, there that, that Perform funded. And, and in that time, the business started to look at what streaming services um, might be able to do or, or what a streaming service might be able to do for the sports industry. Um, Spotify had revolutionized music. Netflix was well on the way to revolutionizing um, entertainment television content. This was sort of 2014, early 2015. And I, I did some research uh, around that that ultimately played a part in, in the, and the foundation of the zone. So my, my seven years with the zone really started at that point when we were just five of us in a room uh, trying to work out what a, a play for perform group might look like to build a streaming platform. Clearly since then, the business has grown very, very quickly. It's grown widely. Japan was one of our first launch markets, along with Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And I had the opportunity to move to Tokyo, which was just uh, too good an opportunity to pass. Um, I spent two years over there, uh, launching the business, building an office uh, of people, uh, acquiring rights for the Japanese business, and obviously positioning design as a brand new brand in that country. Um, hugely challenging very enriched professional experience and on a personal level spending two years in a, in a, in a market as foreign and as different as Japan from London was, was great. So that coupled with the last four and a half years, five years, almost in, in the States. Um, yeah, I, I feel incredibly privileged to have spent, you know, a decent chunk of my career now working internationally. Um, you learn a whole lot of, of, of different things. You learn what's the same, more of what's different country to country. And I think that the differences between ways of working, even between a country like the UK and the US is very, very pronounced when you, when you come in and you have to. I was going to ask you that Joe, mm -hmm. um, because one in the, in the States, you probably hear it with your New York colleagues. There's just so much New York versus LA conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know there's probably a lot to say about Japan and other places, but I'm curious, like New York versus London, like probably like the two epicenters of finance, of business, of culture, mm. um, you know, just just for our, our people who love travel, love, uh, love yeah. all these comparisons, like, you know, because especially because like we both speak English, we have all these like yeah. similarities, like one thing I love about London is the pace is very comfortable and familiar coming from New York and like, and like I crave that I'm like, oh, I'm getting an adventure i'm getting this this ex international experience but at the same time there's this like familiarity but when mm -hmm. i get deep into my expat wormhole and i start actually looking at like what the move would require and stuff you see so many people that are like yep yeah, it's a bit different once you actually do it so like as someone who's done it and lived on both mm -hmm. sides of the pond like culturally and business wise what do you see as a bit of like well this is the same this applies everywhere and these are the things i totally have to consider you know in these different markets yeah i mean Lon london and uh, new york have lots of similarities but the uk and the us have lots of differences and although they are pockets of each of those countries that are not necessarily representative of the wider country there obviously are pronounced differences london is uh, a fast paced city 
no question. It's nowhere near as fast paced as New York. New York is London on, you know, times 10. It, it, it's, it's enormous, um, the difference in pace. Uh, New York, I think, is much smaller uh, as a city. You're able to get anywhere within half an hour on the subway. You can get around very easily. London's a much bigger landmass. The population spread out over a much larger sort of um, space. Um, I think what that probably means is people in London choose their quarter. They choose their part of London. They stick in most and they stay there for most of their socializing. Whereas I feel in New York, you're able to jump around and experience a lot. And that's the lifestyle that New York sort of offers you. Um, people live very centrally in New York, you know, it's, it, the equivalent places to Soho or the West Village or um, Midtown, they're not populated by by residential properties in, in London, they're, they're businesses. People live in suburbs, so they, they retreat to their suburbs, um, the equivalents of Westchester or um, you know, the, the sort of parts of the Bronx, maybe parts mm-hmm. of Queens and Brooklyn. There's far there's far less population density centrally in the city, which which changes the pace of it, especially at the weekends. Um, so how so does that like impact with- business or like your viewpoint on the on the market or even like how Dazone should position itself across different territories? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure it affects Dazone. It's just it's just, it's just a pronounced difference in the way of life and, and and the pace of the city. I think you have much more space in the UK. Um, Look, in terms of the, the working differences, um, I, I think Americans are very direct and the way they do business is very direct. Um, they get to the point very, very quickly. European and, and Asian business practices are probably a little bit uh, more, um, there are processes people go through. There are there are ways and etiquettes of doing things that are perhaps slightly more uh, measured and a, and a bit softer. Um I don't think Americans would be offended by me saying they're more direct than, than other people in the world. I think they, they, they pride themselves on that. Yeah. You definitely know very quickly, I think, in, a, in an American business conversation where someone stands. I think sometimes in the UK or in Europe, you maybe have to work it out of them a bit more. It's definitely the case in Japan, in my experience, completely different business culture. Um, but I, I noticed that really, really early. Um, I, th- I was amazed. I mean, coming to the US as you know, someone who hadn't lived here before, coming in to sort of head up an office here, I, I was I was pretty surprised by how direct people who were working for DAZN in, in, in North America were immediately, very confident, very much immediately saying, this is my opinion, this is what we should do, you need to consider this, you need to consider that, or the other people presenting different opinions. Um, I don't think British people in the same situation would be as direct. There'd be a bit of a softer landing, a bit more of a feeling each other out. So I think you have to be cognizant of that when you're working in different cultures that although we speak the same language and there is a special relationship between the UK and the US and there's lots of cultural and business practices we share, there are also lots of things that are different. And I think it's it's more subtle. You pick it up over time. Um, but yeah, the, the way the city moves, London and New York, the way business is done in the two cities is, is different. Um, not insurmountably different, but it's just different. It takes a little bit of getting used to. Yeah, no, I love... I love learning more about that from someone who's actually like sat in that seat. And I think, you know, we're increasingly global. Like, so a lot of people are going to have to deal with that. A lot of, you know, whether it's travel, whether it's someone like you who's stationed different places for long amounts mm. of time, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th- th- that's so, also true. Like well, Japan, Japan, on, on Japan, it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how Japan as a country and as a business place to do business changes over time because for a country that is so entwined with, you know, it's just a G7 country, it's got a huge economy, 120 million people, major banks, major insurance companies, major manufacturing businesses, major gaming businesses, tech businesses. For for a country that's so entwined with the global economy, it's extremely different. It's much, much more pronounced a difference between London or New York and Tokyo than the difference between London and New York. It's, 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 com- it's completely different. It's on another level in terms of the, st- the step change. So it's going to be interesting as the world does become more global, as there is more requirement for businesses and countries and economies to work together more, more closely, um, how Japan, a country that doesn't naturally embrace change as readily as others do, it's got a beautiful set of customs, a beautiful set of traditions, in every part of its you know, life in Japan, including business. It can be interesting to see over the next generation how much change is actually brought about because 
you know, it hasn't changed as a country as much, I don't think, culturally or socially as as others have in the last sort of generation. So the next generational forces as they come through and they start taking power and having more influence in society, it's going to be interesting to see how much change they enact versus, you know, the UK, the US, Australia, wherever else. So um, going to be an interesting one to watch. Yeah. And I, I've always, I've had, I've traveled a decent amount, but it's been a little bit like Westernized, like a lot of Europe, a lot of Western Europe, mm. all over the States. Um, I've always wondered, like, like the East, my friends and people I know have spent real time in China, Japan, and even those places are so different, Korea, but it's like, it is, it's, it's a different world. I even feel like that sometimes being in California versus New York, like, you know, because truly you have to you have to kind of like get over the fact that it's not new york stop trying to make it stop trying to find the walkable neighborhood that reminds you it's not it's like another country it's a whole different, different thing. Yeah. perspective on life now mm-hmm. the zone like i was mentioning I'm, I'm really glad you jumped into that aside about japan though because um because this type of stuff i just sit around watching documentaries and thinking about what are the cultural differences but like um it, it is fascinating and applicable because I think it's very pronounced that DAZN has a global positioning. Like you have these, you know, media rights all over the place. It's like, like one thing that was curious to me is NFL. I believe you have like Canada, Germany, Austria, Switzerland are the countries. And so it's just like such a unique perspective on how we will spread sport Mm. throughout. Mm. Um, Mm. But one thing that I also noticed, like it's almost like that's been the thing we've known about DAZN for the past few years now. But I also see a lot of language from you all is like looking beyond broadcasting, um, looking at a larger ecosystem where whether it's the live events or it's news, it's highlights. I saw you have like the Ronaldo documentary comments or like original content, e-commerce, betting, Mm. gaming. Um, What... What does that mean, you know, in the position that you're in where you're kind of like at the helm um, and responsible for a lot of the vision? Like what what is the zone in the 2020s? What does it evolve to? Yeah, look, I think what the zone is now is is very different to what the zone will become in the, the next few years. Um, I, I would make a criticism of the streaming industry around sport, sports streaming um, industry over the last few years to say that we haven't really leveraged the fact that we are digital as an industry to fundamentally change and improve what the consumer's experience is of watching sport. Let me explain that. If you were watching in the UK a Sky Sports broadcast of the Premier League 10 years ago, you sat on your sofa, you watched and on a big screen, a linear channel play out the Premier League game. Production was high quality. Um, the experience was excellent. HD, probably early HD at that time. Same in the US on ESPN with an NFL or an NBA broadcast. Um, what the streaming industry and sports done to date has take that feed from Sky Sports, from ESPN, and put it behind a different paywall on an app and stream it to you. Yes, you can watch it on your mobile phone. Yes, you've got uh, tablets and other devices that you can watch the content on. Yes, you can do it on the go. Yes, you probably have a more flexible relationship with the uh, with the broadcaster. You're not locked into a 24 month contract. It's more suited to your lifestyle. It's more easy. It's more flexible. It's maybe more affordable. Um, what what you, we haven't done is fundamentally uh, make the experience different and enriched and better. Um, we've now got an opportunity with the convergence of new technology around broadcast. So the integration of betting, the reduction of latency, the delay of, of, of content coming through. So as close as possible to absolutely live, um, not 20 seconds behind that allows betting to happen in in a more meaningful way. Uh, the introduction of technology that allows peer to peer conversation, like me and you are talking now, whilst we're watching the same game. Mm-hmm. interacting with thousands of other people watching the game, uh, paying to enter different rooms around the broadcast with you know, different subscription tiers or NFTs or different tokens that allow you access to a watch-along party with a, with a relevant celebrity or athlete, alternative broadcasts, um, different interact- interactive tools and toys and engagement tactics that 
we haven't used to date. Now, I think when sports streaming, including DAZN, gets its teeth into all of that stuff and starts executing, bringing all of that together and making the product experience significantly different and significantly better than watching on a big screen TV like you could 10 years ago, the value and the potential of streaming is going to be unleashed on sport and it's going to make the, the consumer experience significantly better. We haven't really done that yet as an industry. And for me, that is where the zone is going. We want to build a destination for all things that sports fans do. We want the zone to be the first thing a sports fan thinks about and does when he or she wakes up. I check BBC Sport 30 times a day. I'm sure you check ESPN for your American sport. I, I check both and, and, but, and BBC. We're global. Right. Okay. Exactly. So, so the, the, the regularity with which we consume content and news and gossip and opinion and um, the regularity that we're on those products, we want to zone to be the same thing. We want it to cover all aspects of fandom. So I'm a sports fan. My relationship with the sports I love is, of course, centered around content, watching the games live, on demand, interviews, opinion, the opinion of other fans, and a major rise of that on, on YouTube in terms of f- fan-produced content in the last five or six years, in particular channels supporting a team, talking in a different way, in a more casual way, giving fans a voice, uh, buying tickets, buying merchandise, uh, buying travel to go and follow your team, um, betting, gaming, peer-to-peer conversation. There's so many different things that make up what it is to be a sports fan. And I think DAZN's vision is to become the destination platform on which all of those things happen for sports fans. So a whole lot more than just content. Content's always going to be central um, to a sports fan. You know, if you're an NFL fan, you have to watch your team play every weekend. That's one reason to be on the platform. Maybe two, if you're watching build-up content or midweek content. We would love to make it... uh, a sports fans need to be on the zone 10, 15, 20 times a day to do a whole bunch of different things. So aggregate the different elements of fandom in one place on one destination. That's, I think, the vision of the zone. That's what we're building. Um, executing it will take us a bit of time. We're, we're putting it, the different parts together. The great thing for us is we've established a very, very solid business globally. We're the only player globally that has the distribution of content, uh, partnerships, a technical platform that can operate in 200 plus markets and territories around the world. That is no small feat. We've got relationships with all the rights holders that matter, the the leagues, the federations, the teams, the athletes that matter globally. We have an established relationship in dozens of markets, particularly in eight or nine. Um, That's a tremendous head start. So we're going to leverage that head start uh, that we've invested heavily in to now go into the next phase of our business, the next phase of sports streaming. And that is that that destination platform. Yeah, definitely ambitious. And I see, you know, the reasoning behind it. Um, you know, it seems like building that sort of contained community ecosystem, as you all refer to it, it's it, it's going to be a way of the future. A lot of a lot of companies are like, I don't know, I think of Xbox, like right now, what they're doing between Game Pass, cloud gaming, all these different things mm-hmm. where they're like, whatever you want to do in gaming, if you want to just stream, if you like, we're going to try to provide it for you. But the reason I bring them up is because I remember, what was this, 2013, when the last generation of consoles came out, they kind of like famously dropped the ball because they tried to do too much. They said, they said, we're the new home entertainment system. Mm. You can plug mm. in your cable. You could do this. You could do that. And PlayStation was a hundred dollars cheaper. And it was like, yeah, you could just play games really well here. And I wonder like, how do you balance that with something like the zone where you say, okay, look, man, we got to scale this business. So we have to think about all these other things. And also it's a cool, it sounds cool. It sounds like this big global, amazing idea, but, but, you know, is there a piece of it where it's like, well, we have to just have, like, the best production. Like, people have to enjoy watching yeah. our fights the way yeah, they yeah. enjoy yeah. watching Showtime and Sky. Or we have to, you know, get the latency. Like, how do, how do you, someone who has 100 people hitting you up all times a day, so many different priorities, just say, well, like, I always love the phrase, keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah. And how much of it is just like, mm, we just need the best streams in the world. And then this other virtual yeah. watch party stuff will come. I think, I think a few things about that. Um, I think our, our head start on this, how established our business is in streaming. We are focused purely on streaming, right? We are, we are not 
balancing a traditional linear business, we're not having to manage the slow decline of our linear business and the gradual rise of our digital business. The streaming product is everything we do. We've built that. Has it been seamless since day one? Absolutely not. Have we learned a bunch of things? Have we fallen over and had technical issues at times? Yes, they're happening infrequently now. Very, very rarely those things happen because our business and our tech is, is solid. So that's the start point. That's what, that is the core product, serving consumers with super high quality, no buffering streams, as much content as they can consume. We want to serve them with that, uh, with that as, uh, as often as possible and as regularly as possible. Um, that is the core of it. Once you've got that done, and that is no small feat, doing that globally is no small feat. The operational network and infrastructure that we've built, no one else has. So that's number one, we're, we're, we're comfortable with that. It gives us the luxury of being able to, in a structured way, and in a business that is organized appropriately to say, right, we'll now start gradually plugging things on. And it's not gonna happen overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day, right? And it's not gonna be one person or one team doing all of it. You've got the core business, which is the streaming product, uh, the subscription service, you gradually, for example, in, in, in our market, you've gone, okay, how do we evolve that? We want to launch pay-per-view. We want to be having a pay-per-view platform to access more content. So we can partner more easily in the market to commercialize our content better, uh, to better serve fans ultimately with value and regularity of content. We need that. Okay, that's a new bit of tech. We'll gradually bring that in and we'll seamlessly move it into our offering. At the same time, you've got a betting division who are working on a betting product. And over time, once that's established off platform as a standalone design bet brand with a separate product, we'll gradually integrate that into the business as well. And at each phase, there'll be a, you know, not to get too technical or too boring, the, 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 the program management will bring it in and gradually add it. So gradually over time, not trying to do it all at once, we'll add more and more uh, strings to our bro. And over time, as our operations and infrastructure have improved over the last five years, in the next five years, We'll gradually start walking and doing more and running faster with more things as part of the design business. You're right. It will be clumsy of us, ineffective of us um, to, to just try and do all of it overnight. That's not going to happen. We're going to manage it in a, in a prioritized way as we integrate more and more things to the design ecosystem, to the design product. It will be done in, a, in, a, in an organized way. That's how we do it. I see our strategic advantage in, uh, of our business is our existing global scale. Right. You're the not trying to figure decisions. out streaming right now. So. No, and actually I mentioned I mentioned Perform Group. We've had operations, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in a lot of the countries we're now a major sports broadcaster and we've been operating in for the last 15, 20 years in a different way. But the relationships, the understanding of the market, how sports fans consume product and what they want, we've got that established sort of uh, information in our DNA. We know it. So that gives us a tremendous advantage relative to other players who are having to go into new markets and start from scratch altogether. Well, on that note, kind of one of the last things, um, you know, I, I love a good free flowing convo, so we, we'll do whatever comes up naturally. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that I want to ask you like about women's sports, women's soccer, specifically about boxing, about, you know, some of your colleagues who have their own, you know, crazy resumes that maybe you've learned something from them but right before that um i just want to ask like the pay-per-view portion i think like the community has a lot of feelings about that um you have spoken to it before um but i've always seen it you know it seemed more like someone trying to press you and get something i'm, I'm just asking you like person to person mm. um there's there's this idea or you'll see people say like the zone was basically in service of like getting rid of pay-per-view or, or like something like that. And now we're in that business. Um, what, what is the reason? Is that something that you're like, well, we need it because of the revenue it, it provides, but we would like to move on from it conceptually or like, you know, what's the, what's the no, BBB look, thoughts? I think, I think a lot of the feedback we've had from boxing fans in the U S has been in reaction to our the marketing campaign. We first launched in the U S which was sort of labeled pay-per-view is dead. Mm -hmm. And we had these sort of funny adverts of boxing figures smashing up pay-per-view set-top boxes and um, her welcoming this next phase of streaming, which was the abandonment of pay-per-view for boxing. Um, was it a catchy 
quite tongue in cheek marketing campaign for a new brand to come into America and establish a name for itself. Yes. Was it effective? Probably. Yeah. And it, it was, it was definitely one way of entering the market. Our brand is disruptive. We're not traditional American media company. We wanted to make a name for ourselves and we did. Um, do I think elements of that were, were clumsy and probably done without much foresight? Yes. I think to a certain extent, We've had to row back in terms of relationships with people we want to work with in the market who've made their business in pay-per-view. Um, we're, we're in the process of doing that. And I think, you know, since I've had the job I'm in now, I'm definitely trying to do that and, and, and build the bridges that perhaps were slightly um, burned a little bit by our entry and how aggressive it was. Um, it's important. You'll remember, it's very, very hard for a business to come into the to the US in any industry without any sort of established infrastructure or big company supporting it and make a name for itself. It's such a big country. There's so much going on in let in sport, in sport alone, let alone anywhere else. You're competing noise wise and brand wise with so many different things, other sports, other entertainment stories, just the general noise of America is, is extremely loud and coming in and establishing a name for yourself is hard. So I understand why we did it. Um, we've changed our tactics now, candidly, our business, you know, needs to make profit, needs to make money. Pay-per-view will help us do that. We'll commercialize, uh, the rights that we buy in boxing better with pay-per-view. We don't want to use it for every single fight. We won't. Our subscription business is the most important bit of our U S business, the regularity of, uh, billing relationship and, uh, customer relationship with hundreds of thousands of, of boxing fans every month is is really, really important for, for our business. So we're not going to put that at risk. Sparingly, we'll use pay-per-view where, where it's necessary uh, for us to make a, a small profit, for us to partner and make fights happen. That's another key thing I think gets forgotten about sometimes. If you're Canelo Alvarez or you're Ryan Garcia or you're uh, a boxer with a huge following, you want to be on pay-per-view because you know that's the, the route you, you you want to take to make the most money for yourself and these guys careers are short at the best of times they're only one fight away from never fighting again at any given time so they need to make maximize their earnings they require us to have a pay-per-view platform so that they can maximize their earnings and we if we want to work with them and serve their fights to boxing fans and overall position a product in the course of a year to boxing fans that has the best fights and the best fighters we needed a pay-per-view platform um so we built one and we've had to be apologetic in, at times to, to, to fans that reacted to our original launch campaign. Um, as the spokesperson for the business, I hold our hand up and say, listen, situation's changed. The market's changed. Our business has evolved. Um, have you been getting amazing value from DAZN? Yes. Will you continue to get best in market value from DAZN despite the introduction of pay-per-view? In my opinion, yes. Um, and the numbers, our growth over the last sort of year in particular, when we've had the pay-per-view platform available to us, given that we've used it sparingly and haven't, uh, to use a British phrase, sort of taken the piss with it and used it every week, um, uh, you know, reflect the fact that fans understand that. And I think boxing fans, more than most sports fans, understand the business of the sport. They are clued They're up really on what's going in. on. Not, not everyone. I mean, one thing about like front office sports, though, why you know, I, I have the confidence in our business is because that's just changed culturally. Like where boxing fans have always been, I feel like all fans are starting to move toward. Most people know like NFL media rights, how much the contract is for. Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I was younger. Maybe we were younger. I don't know if that was always the case. I don't know if your average fan was like, oh yeah, Amazon has a 11 year deal that's worth no. a billion. <laughs> but now that's just part of the, the conversation. Um, of course, when we when we think about when we think about money, I'm it's almost like word association, but money Mayweather pops in. You got a you have a fight coming up in like a few weeks here. He does. He's fighting KSI's brother Deji. Yeah. Uh, is that the is that the like Saudi or Dubai? It's or? in it's in it's in uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates um, on the 14th of November, and it will be broadcast in a number of countries around the world on the zone, including here in the US. Yeah, you excited about that one? I am. Yeah, it'd be great. I mean, clearly, we should talk about our X series uh, boxing celebrity crossover boxing series. It's a really interesting area of growth for our company, and I think it's an interesting project to watch for the industry. Um, 
It's, a lot it's moved of on from being novel. Well, you know, it's still yeah, novel, I mean, it's, but but it's it is different novel, but it's, because it it's used different. to be. It used to just be like, oh, these silly celebs fighting each other, and now it's like people tune in the way they tune in to Canelo Gennady. Like, like it's a real thing. It's not just like some silly little sideshow. So you all are really trying to like to help accelerate the business potential of that. Absolutely, and I think the reason we do that isn't for some gimmick to sort of show that we're innovative and going after younger fans. Um, we do it because it makes a lot of business sense. Um, there's a lot made of, and I think a lot of your audience is slightly younger, right? And I think a lot of the work you do attracts young, younger audience who are making their way in the industry. Um, up, there's a lot made of that generation coming through now, people from the age of 16 to 25, maybe some of whom are in their first jobs, they're starting to have credit cards and make the buying decisions in more and more US households now, right? Because they're getting to that age where they're moving in on their own and with their friends. There's a lot made of that generation and, 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 and their relationship with sport. Um, there's a risk potentially of apathy. Now, when I grew up, similar age maybe to you, at school on a Wednesday, there were four or five things to talk about that were on TV the night before. Right, mm -hmm. there was the OC in the UK. Like the, that, that we watched show it as well. I'm a, I'm, a great, Seth, great I'm a Seth Cohen yeah, fan Seth, for Seth life. and Ryan and, and all those guys, Summer and Marissa. There was also the Champions League maybe on a Tuesday night, Wednesday night. There wasn't a whole lot else that was going on in I remember in Ch Chappelle's show had that lock. Like, it, like exactly. when I think back to that culture, it was like we had a way more homogenous culture. And it wasn't like, yeah, I was on TikTok for an hour last night in my part of the world. And yeah. I was doing the same. And they both, all those videos had millions and millions the, of views. It was like we all correct. watched the thing the night before. The same thing. So there, there was less, there was a more concentrated entertainment world. And as a result, if you made it as a star in sport, you everyone knew. Same with a big TV show, everyone knew made the kids coming through now have grown up with the internet. I didn't have the internet into my house until I was, I think, 16 or 15. Yeah. And it was slow. I didn't spend hours on it. I didn't really spend much time on the internet until I was at university. The kids now have grown up with high-speed internet, serving them with hundreds of thousands of different entertainment options to consume mm -hmm. whenever they want. So that takes the entertainment sort of spectrum way beyond sport into a whole different realm. And it gives birth to people like Logan Paul and KSI and uh, this whole community of YouTubers People now, who you could ask some people and they're like, who is KSI? And that to millions of people is like potentially the, the most famous important. person in Correct. the world. Correct. Um, and that's why, that's why uh, some people of our age and definitely of our parents' age are sort of amazed by this phenomenon. It doesn't amaze me because the internet has given birth to different content formats and entertainment options, which have their own protagonists and their own stars. So to counter the risk of apathy to sport and the kids just not being interested in sport as much as we were growing up, we sort of thought, right, how can we, how can we reach that audience? The great thing is these YouTubers who are massive celebrities, some of the best marketeers you're ever going to meet uh, with an ability to sell hydration drinks, pay-per-view boxing events, merchandise, YouTube videos. They can literally pick and choose what industries they work in. And it seems to be successful for the top guys. Um, they have extremely loyal audiences. That's how they do it. Let's let's push them to work with the zone and create boxing events that their audiences will, 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 will come and watch on the zone. So we've gone to where they are. We haven't tried to take kids and, and, and force them to watch uh, established traditional sports formats. We've said, let's adjust the sports format and take it to these people where they are, which is alongside KSI, Logan Paul, Jake Paul, etc. And I think it speaks to the skill set and the creativity of these people that they can they can pick up, frankly, and choose what they want to do next. And they're confident enough and skilled enough in many cases to go after and do it. And I, I look at the spectrum of their businesses and it is incredible. I mean, Logan and KSI, we've worked with more closely than with Jake. Looking at what they do day to day, week to week, it is so broad. Um, and it feels like they could... It feels like they're kind, of got, they're the kind of guys that could sell ice to the Eskimos, you know, that they could, they could literally pick and choose an industry and say... We are going to now market the hell out of this. We're going to make it central to what you do. It's 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 great for me and our business that they've said we love boxing. We're going to start boxing now. So we've been able to say, okay, great, do that on design and bring with bring with um, you the tens of millions of people that watch you do whatever you do, um, whenever you want to do it, and come and do it on design. And it's great for us, and we're we're delighted to be in partnership with KSI around the X series. Um, we've got a big announcement coming soon for an event in January that will be in the US that will be 
a massive pay-per-view level event for um for our business around that um and we're very excited about it yeah um i i love it and that's actually like part of the genesis of this show um and why it's called my other passion it's evolved over like you know weeks of episodes we started in july but it, it was catered toward the idea of this generation of people who do lots of things like uh, we i don't think anyone says oh you're just a singer you just play basketball it's almost the expectation that the nba players are into fashion and they're in tune with gaming and that the singers are also acting and have their social stuff and just you know businesses whether you're investing in stuff that's completely out of your purview like look at um like jessica alba or um reese witherspoon like these huge exits that they've had with like baby care companies or with production mm. studios it's just mm. it's a new day and age and i've always wanted to bring that to the forefront i well, think for sure i think it's like a big part of what kind of goes unnoticed or unspoken about in business everyone's just like joe you're the ceo what are you doing at the zone and i and, and that's really important but i i guess this would be a good time to get into like joe who are you? Who's the kid from London? Like, like, what did you grow up on? I, clearly, you like the OC. I feel you. <laughs> justice for like justice OC. for justice for Trey. Um, <laughs> no, but but <laughs> but like like what what uh you know what are in the arts? What music and film and and just like things that inspired you that set you down the path that you're on. And now you look up. Yeah. You're in your thirties. You're in New York City. Probably something you saw on TV your whole life. You go and walk by every day, like, um, but what got you here? What are, what are some of your, like, you know, deeper passions and interests? Yeah. Um, listen, I, I grew up in West London. Um, my father's Polish uh, by, by background. Uh, so his parents met during the war and, and ended up coming to London at the end of the Second World War. Um, we've had a long sort of family history and with a lot of the, the Polish family settled in France. You should listen to Poland so, by Little Yachty, though. Just not to, just to cut you off. There's a, I, I, you heard it. I've heard. I've heard. I've seen. There's there's like a pixelated music video, isn't there? As well, I got sent that yeah. a couple of times. So po with, Poland's like really hot right now. That's all. Yeah, I'm Poland saying. is hot right now, and my dad will be happy about. It. But I don't think my dad's listening to much Little Yachty. But I'll, I'll double check with him tonight when I uh, when I good. catch up with him. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of time spent in, in in France growing up. A lot of my cousins and family are over there. So my parents uh, split split their time now between. London and France, as I did as a kid, um, always quite, um, you know, uh, we had like a love affair as a family with the States. We lived in Florida for a year when I was a kid. My parents were teachers and they, they did a year teaching in uh, Palm Beach. So I lived as a very young child in, in Florida, but mainly in, in London. Um, always had a passion for sport. My dad played very high level, not, not NBA level basketball, but high level British professional basketball. Um, and as a six foot white man that was quite a good achievement i think he, he's, he's outperformed himself there hmm. um i didn't get the i didn't quite get the basketball skill set um myself but always played a lot of sport never particularly to a high level played a lot of sports to an okay level um played cricket played rugby both quite british things I'm not sure you spent much time growing up playing either of those things but soccer um athletics um or, always doing um different sports that has always been a huge passion of mine. Um, it definitely led me to, you know, my career in sport it inspired me to want to work in sport. I, I think I realized at quite a young age, I wasn't going to be able to make it as a professional athlete. So why not work with them in a, in a more administrative capacity? Um, I did that at university, at the cricket club at university. I was the president there, which gave me some, you know, amateur student level experience of running a sports organization with, with my friends, which was great fun, always involved in, sort of organizing sports tours and stuff like that. So sport was a big part of my life, as was music. I've always been a big, big fan of music. Um, You're coming from America. like one of the most important places in, in music history, um, especially for like sure. when we when we grew up, it was like, because I think we are about the same age, it was like the post-punk revival was hitting. So you had all those great bands like you know, Kaiser Chiefs, all this stuff happening in yeah. London in the in the mid sure. that block party. You know, I had to I get the in, party. I had to get I the NME. Party. I had to go yeah. to the part of the record store and get the imports. All yeah. the cool kids in the U.S. would do that, but those type of bands like changed my life. A lot of American kids' lives, and then you have people For like sure. the Killers who were emulating that sort of glam synth pop yeah. that 
you know, came yeah. out of the UK. You had you had maybe slightly earlier the, the Libertines. You had uh, the Arctic Monkeys in that era as well. So oh I my god, up. dude! The first Arctic Monkeys record. Can can we really for one second? Because that that came to the states and it was a big deal. It was like my last year of high school. Um, it was just like like what was it like to be in London at the time? I know part of it's nostalgia. It was like yeah, it was cool. I listened to the album, but was there like a frenzy? Because that's how it was presented to us in America. Like oh my god, the hottest. It was yeah. like they almost tried to make it like a new British invasion. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think it was. I mean, I was I didn't really hit puberty until about the age of seventeen or eighteen. So I struggled to get into these places where these guys were playing. Where a lot of my friends had chest hair at fifteen and very legitimate <laughs> fake IDs. We all had. We all had these very good fake IDs that um, a guy at our school who shall remain nameless sourced for us from the equivalent of the British equivalent of the DMV. Um, so they were legit. But I looked nice. so ridiculously young relative to the age that was on my fake ID that I think even the, 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 the doorman and the bouncers were having none of it. So I struggled for a while to get into the clubs and the, the bars that were hosting these guys. But yeah, it was a, it was a huge part of... I think British culture in the 90s and the noughties, um, different types of music. There's a big dance sort of movement in the 90s. I was slightly too young for that. You see a lot of that talked about around the sort of Manchester United story out of Manchester, the class of 92, Beckham's era and Gary Neville and all those guys. They were coming through at a time where Manchester was the centre of the world culturally for a bunch yeah. of music. Are you Blur or Oasis? What did, what, I'm, an, did I'm you... an Oasis fan. Okay. I'm an Oasis fan. Um, Although, shout IDLs. out Damon. Shout out Damon to come sure. back with the Gorillas. The Gorillas, you know, amazing. Huge, and yeah. and some, kid, some, kids I, some kids I grew up with are now in the band Jungle, and they, they played with the Gorillas, I think, this week in the States. They supported them on their US tour. So that's a nice sort of, you know, uh, circular story. Uh, we, 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 yeah, we listened to a whole bunch of different music, and I always had an affinity for American music. We came here a lot on holiday. Um I remember driving through Miami with my mum playing the Obi Trice CD, thinking that was absolutely hilarious. My mum bought the the parental guidance. Cheers, all the, the cheers, all, with exactly the, the, cover, cheer, yeah. the cheers album, and all the all the swear words blanked out, which means you didn't hear much because every second word was a swear word. Especially with Eminem featured on some of those tracks, you just have like sure. ten seconds that were silent. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of a sort of like parental guidance, explicit content stickers on, on every second CD you bought at the time, but. Yeah, an eclectic taste in music. My dad's a huge Bob Dylan fan, Springsteen fan. So I always grew up around sort of not the cla not classical music, but classics, rock classics. Uh, so music's been a big part of my life. I, I love living in New York now um, because even post COVID, even through COVID in some cases, as soon as it was possible to do so, that the music scene in New York's really sort of picked back up. And that's that's an amazing thing about New York. Any day of the week, you can you can pop out and see there's always bands coming through that you're interested in. Um, so yeah, music's a, a big part of, of, of my life and I'm glad that there is an intersection of music and sport, um, our ownership, uh, to zone access industries also until they floated the business recently owned Warner music. So there's a crossover between or a sister company with Warner music. So there's always conversation between the execs at the zone and Warner about ways we can work together. Those things collide often big, big performances at Canelo events, for example, as well. So mm -hmm. being in entertainment, being in um you know uh an industry that's so at the forefront of culture it's it's great to be able to combine those passions um but yeah listen i, I was lucky enough to get an internship as a young kid at the at the england cricket board the english cricket board which is the sort of governing body of cricket in the uk that was my first love sports wise and uh from that sort of indirectly i ended up getting a job at perform and, and that leads me to my job at the zone so i feel very lucky that I, uh, I had the opportunity to gradually get myself into a company that was going places and had had growth and had an opportunity for me. What I what I loved about it in particular was um, it wasn't. I often say this to people now, young people I speak to. It wasn't Deloitte. It wasn't a big bank with really established processes for how you do things, and there wasn't a two year training contract that you had to go through before you got promoted. It was very much sort of there was no real safety net. There was no real formal training process at that time. It's a bit different now. We're a more mature business than we were then. The stakes are bigger. But you were sort of thrown in as a young person and sort of said, oh, they're your accounts. They're the clients you're going to look after. I'm going to see those people regularly. So if you, if you mess up and you're not doing a good job, I'm going to find out pretty quickly. But if you hold the ball and you prove that you can run with it and you're capable of doing the day-to-day -day job, we're going to give you more and more 
uh, opportunity. We're going to give you more and more stuff to do. If you let us you know, you must have been grinding, Joe, because like you know, oh, you're, sure. you're you're CEO at a pretty young age. Like, I mean, look, there's we're in a we're in an era where there's a lot of entrepreneurs. Like, shit, anybody could kind of make themselves a CEO. But like, dude, you if you look at your resume, it's like this this guy rose through the ranks quickly. I mean, I don't know if in 2016 you were like, wow, I'm going to be North American CEO in six years. No, no, definitely not. Um, but I, I do, I do think you can grind all you want and you can work hard. There's a lot of people who work hard and, and will, will, will do whatever's put in front of them to a high level. It's, it's all, um, irrelevant if you're not in a company that, that is one, got got growth and is going to grow as you're as you and you can grow with it or two going to give you the opportunity to grow within it and i think when when people you know when you work in a startup environment and the zone culturally still has the dna of a startup it's not it's not ever going to be i don't think um organized in a formal traditional business way it's always going to have a certain um nimbleness and and and, and sort of disruptive energy to it one way of describing that at the, in the early days was, was was it was relatively chaotic. You had to find your own way. There were cracks. There were processes that were broken. Um, I thought those cracks were great. I used to say like there are cracks in the wall. Cracks help you climb because if everything was polished and done in a certain way, and you had to wait for someone to move up so you could move in behind them, that's pretty boring, and that's pretty yeah. slow. And I, I and I like the fact that it was it was a meritocracy from the word go. If you were capable and you were good. Uh, it didn't matter if you were 24 and you were an account executive. You could absolutely challenge a senior director or a C-suite, someone um, with information or a different opinion. And I remember very early on being in a meeting where that happened and I offered an opinion um, to a to a very senior member of staff. And there was sort of a few raised eyebrows of, you know. Why is he talking out of turn? Yeah, why is, well, no, what, what, you know, it's a very direct way of doing that. Maybe... maybe my style was a little bit more direct than other people, um, maybe slightly more American than, than other people in the say. UK at the time. Um, but, but you know, it, it was best idea wins is the best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. If you had an opinion and you could back it up and you were confident enough to make it in the right time and you picked your moment, clearly if you're wrong, you're going to look like an idiot. But yeah. but you just pick your moments, right? And I think the, the being in that environment was a massive, massive leg up because – you can work as, soon, as, soon, as hard as you want and as much as you want. But if you're not given the opportunities or the management around you doesn't want to listen, you're not going to get very far. So it's a combination of those things that I think uh, I feel very privileged to have had early in my career. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really interesting to hear about how you got here. Now, looking at the position that you're in, where things are going, um, you know, we talked a bit about boxing. I kind of wanted to specifically talk about women's soccer just because the UEFA Women's Champions League, I believe it's the second season that kicked off, right? So the first season, I see a number, 64 million views globally, 230 plus markets. Yeah. Like, that's great. I, I mean, I love it. Those are not small numbers. But now that we're here, we're having like this human conversation. I'm like, what? what's really going on? What's, what is, what is the potential that you see in women's soccer and women's yeah. sports? Um, you know, other, other properties that you have that you're excited about, like, you know, I, you could throw it all at me in terms of like, okay, cool. We've spoken in an ideological sense, but here's what we are literally doing that you can look forward to that I'm proud of. And yeah. that is going to continue to like, help us reach that vision that I spoke about. Yeah. Well, what's going on is that women's sport is on a tremendous accelerated long overdue growth curve and there are, I could chuck data at you all day to speak to that, but it sounds like you've, you've read the briefing and you, you've got, you've got the data points, right? Yeah, and it we're is, FOS. So we're friggin', you know, when I see Wembley for a friendly sold well, out, when, you when see I see the, the top, Euro. Correct. Correct. When you, when you see that the, the top, this is the most amazing one for me that I, I think it doesn't get spoken about enough. As of right now in 2022, 10 months into the year, the top three most attended games in European soccer stadiums this year to date have all been women's games. There's been two women's Champions League games, uh, including El Clasico between Real Madrid and Barcelona at the new camp in or the Spotify new camp as it's now known in, in Barcelona. And the women's Euro twenty twenty game, uh, one of the England games during that during that time as well was was uh top at the time. It's since been uh, overtaken by the El Clasico. 
That is an unbelievable stat when you compare it to you know, what, what they're competing with. They're competing with long-established Champions League games, men's Champions League games, Premier League games, uh, major national team games in soccer. In all those different countries, women's soccer has come out on top. That is reflective of the interest and the demand for women's sport. Uh, the conversation in the media has massively moved. I, I can feel sort of tangibly in the last two years from discussions about, you know, uh, whether or not women's sport was was um, going to get distribution on on networks to talking about the scale and the pace of change and the quality, the coverage of the of the game itself, not mm-hmm. anything around it, just the game itself. And that is um, tremendously exciting. I think anyone involved in the administration of women's sport should be very proud of that. Um, and excited about what the next sort of growth phase brings. We are investing to zone in women's sport on a global scale. We want to become as part of that destination platform that I spoke about, the home of women's sport globally. We carry rights to a number of different women's soccer properties. You mentioned the Women's Champions League. Um, it's also a number of the European uh, leagues, the domestic leagues um, in Spain, in Germany, and in, in, in Japan. We carry the content to... Um, Women's boxing is on the up and up as well. We, we were proud to host an unbelievable event at Madison Square Garden with Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano that was Unreal. lived up to its billing and then some. And, and the coverage around that and the interest from the media was just the best promotion that we've ever done full stop in boxing. That was I huge. Think. That was special. First first women's main card headline in Madison Square Garden. I thought that was great. For sure. Um, so I think sometimes two or three years ago when we first started investing in women's sport, we'd have conversations with members of the media like this one where they'd say, oh, it's great you're investing in women's sport. And there'd be a suggestion from the media that we were doing it for all the right reasons. It's good. It's a good for the company. It's good for the PR. It's a good CSR message. You know, it's a good narrative. But you're doing it for those reasons, not because it makes business sense. That is absolutely not the case. The, 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 the scale of revenue growth that we can achieve with women's sport is through the roof. The numbers on our platforms, both behind the paywall and on YouTube, where we put a lot of our content in a partnership with YouTube for the Women's Champions League, uh, are tremendous. They're growing. They're being monetized. It makes real business sense to do that. Uh, we've had Adidas and EA Sports come on as major sponsors for our women's soccer content in the last 12 months. Uh, you know, blue chip brands putting their, putting their money behind women's sport because they recognize it can reach a huge audience. Um, and as I say, with, with that, all that interest, with all that, all that investment, with that demand from the public comes better quality production, which we're definitely bringing. It, it drives more media attention. And the thing is circular. The better quality of the production, the more people are seeing the distributions up, the more people are seeing the quality of the competition and, and the quality of the, of the football being played means more sponsors, means more investment. And it all all circular goes back into the game and the game gets better and better. This is how growth starts and it really swirls. You've seen European soccer grow tremendously over the last generation, men's soccer, the Premier League, most notably. I really think the next, maybe more accelerated than a generation, the next 10 years, you're going to see women's sport as a whole blow up and become a major, major, major vertical for sport generally, globally. And with that, the investment will, will come, it will go up, it will increase, it will make rights more expensive for broadcasters like us. But that's a success problem. That's because more people want to watch it. Um, and as we as we do that, as we invest and we build a, ourselves as the home for women's sport, um, yeah, it's fantastic to be, to be doing that. And we're very, very proud to be, you know, um, a major part of, of that of that initiative and that growth. I really love what you said, too, about just, like, the business potential. Like, look, it's cool to be morally sound, to, like, level the playing field. Like, we could use more diversity. We could use more equality. But I've always felt this, whether as a black man, whether looking at women's sports, like, we don't need charity. It's not just so you can wave your PR flag and say, hey, aren't we showing women? It's like, it's like, look. Sometimes you just have to look at it like a shrewd business person or a capitalist. You're in New York City. You're just talking about how direct people are. And it, sometimes it just needs to be, look, this is a business opportunity. This is this is real. We're not going to continue to deny this audience because of like, you know, past biases and, and perceived perceptions that, that aren't really the truth. The truth is, even if you want to remove the emotions and the morals, let's 
let's change how we do business here because there's a lot we stand to gain. And then, and then it helps that a generation of young women or a generation of people of color or whatever can have the representation that, you know, will help them in those more like insular ways. But, you know, we just got, we, the reason why I think that's important is because I think that's almost, I don't want to say it's like sad. It's just like reality. It's like, that's where like the real respect comes from sometimes. So you have to educate people that it's not just so we can, you know, put on a LinkedIn somewhere that we're being mindful of people from different walks of life. It's like, nah, Mm. the same way that you look at men, that you look at white men, you look at traditional things as like these drivers, Pay some respects to the other communities or you're going to get left behind. You will be in 2030. Like, why didn't we invest yeah. more? And if, if you do it, if you if you invest in things as a business purely because it looks like the right thing to do or for some sort of charity motivation, as a business that's ultimately judged on its bottom line financial performance, that's not sustainable. So we're, we're not in the business of investing in things because it's the right thing to do we're in the business of investing in things because it makes us money and it makes our business stronger. Uh, bottom line is women's sport is good business and it's got huge exponential growth potential. And we are extremely excited about opportunities where we can invest early in a phase, in a movement. Women's sport clearly has been around for a long time and it's been uh, ignored by major media uh, relative to men's sport for a long time. I think women's tennis, which we've been a partner of, in the perform group days with WTA media for a long time, women's tennis, uh, has made what was, was, a, was significantly more advanced than other women's sport in terms of the, the relative equality of pay, um, the, the level of fan uh, stardom that, that, that the stars could, could achieve. Look at the Williams sisters in his example, but even before them in the generation before them, other sports are starting to, to catch up and get that level of investment. You know, I think it's, you know, my family now, when, when the England women's national soccer team play, are talking about it on WhatsApp. Yeah, we, oh. We're having a family conversation about it in the same way that we do around men's rugby national team games or men's football national team games. It's like part of the national conversation. And that's an anecdotal example, but it shows that there is a widespread appeal in this stuff. And, and it's not because of, if that, if that was fluffed up by the media, is it the right thing to talk about effectively as a charity initiative? That would last five minutes. The yeah. public wouldn't, maintain their interest in that. yeah they would because the next thing comes along but it isn't that it's got gen it's, it's generally genuinely tapped into uh emotions of, of 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 the population and i think it's it's fantastic my male groups of friends talk about it now it's no longer um you know you, you see less and less stupid memes of women making mistakes on football pitches and people laughing at it which happened three or four years ago the quality level is is, is always been there, but it's now getting the platform to show itself. And yeah, we're, a, we're a small part of that. And we're glad that we're able to use our platform and our investment to, to do that. Um, we'll continue to do so as long as it makes business sense. And I think that's going to continue for a long, long time. Yeah, I think uh, ESPN and probably a few other places could still stand to clean up their comments. It's like wild to me what some people feel emboldened to comment. Um, but, but, you know, look, I'm not a pessimist. I can tell over the past decade that since I came into adulthood in the workforce, the conversation is different and it's not contrived. It's like, I see the homies on the timeline Uh, talking about WNBA the same way, you know, watching women's, we got women's March madness now, like all this stuff is is super important. It's not, you know, it's not just my daughter is in soccer, love that, but it's also not just because of that. It's because like there's great competition, there's great talent and we all love sport. We all love to sit down or pull out our phone or whatever and be entertained, be amazed by Mm -hmm. the prowess and the athleticism. And there's incredible stuff happening. I think we're more conscious as a culture uh, of that. Um, So I know, you know, this, uh, just keep it real. This always, this happens a lot on the show. Um, We have these fascinating, awesome conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then we, I'm, I'm muting, I forgot to put on Do Not Disturb. Uh, but, you know, we we wind up talking about all these things so passionately. So I really do appreciate, I know you're a busy guy. I appreciate you taking the time to, like, no, really great. get into things with me. Um, I do want to just chat a couple other things to close it out. It's honestly, like, it's big picture to his own stuff. I think this will take this conversation home in a good mm. way. Um, 
But before that, one thing, how do you handle like personal feedback almost like i'll just i'll just be transparent like your instagram is kind of funny man because people are like in there hitting you with suggestions mm-hmm. and comments and you know That's i, I see even i even see you reply okay mate uh this is my sister's wedding though you know that was like, the best one that was the best one ever there that made a, me laugh out loud yeah so my sister loves this there was there was a well, I thought it was quite a nice series of photos. My sister got married last summer. Yeah. Obviously a special moment for my family and it was great. The castle looked you beautiful know, I, out in France. It was, that, it was, it was beautiful. And, um, you know, I don't post a whole lot on Instagram, but that's a nice thing you want to remember. I use my Instagram a little bit like a diary of, you know, thing. I want to look a back on it in the future. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I, I posted a couple of photos and it was at the time, I forget the specific fight, but there'd been some fight that had broken down or, a fight hadn't been made and design were obviously involved in the conversation around that. And the guy wrote something like, um, you know, when are you going to effing make this fight you waste of space or something like that? And I just said, you know, listen, man, this is, this is a post about my sister's wedding. This is nothing. This is, there's other forums. If you want to voice your opinion on how I'm doing at work or how I'm, uh, you know, how, how I'm handling myself professionally, like, you know, make a comment on a on a zone customer services form there's other ways to do it but it was very very funny the marriage of boxing trolls and my sister's wedding is two things i never thought that would be marred together but they were it's funny man because sometimes the trolls really just want attention because as soon as you said that he was like well thanks i'm, I'm just glad i got to talk to you you know i wanted to try to reach out um yeah. so yeah it's very funny it's, it's it's definitely funny um but i think it also shows like like people have an emotional attachment to the zone. Like it's almost, mm. you know, maybe it might have its little drawbacks, um, some, some no, it's invasion, funny. but it's funny and like it's it. so good. So you have a good perspective on it. And then for me as, you know, outsider looking in, I just feel like, yes, you want, you want positive. You want people who are more so just coming. I love you. I love this. Da, 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 da. But I think one thing that you cannot like understate is is the power of like emotional attachment like like for people to care you know there's always the phrase of like love and hate is the same thing expressed differently you know true true the really thing you want to avoid is apathy you want to mm-hmm. avoid people who don't care what the zone does you know mm-hmm. and so so these type of things are proving that people care i think um and you're probably as in touch if not significantly more than me that people are invested in. We talk about the future of the company, talking about where we're going. Um, I think just like the the what you can bring quality wise and like like property wise, media rights rise. Like, what are the what are the things that you're maybe chasing that you're like, okay, well, we if we get this, like this is going to take us over the edge. We need this this with the NFL or this with formula mm. one or this with the NBA yeah. premier league. Like, and I, and the thing is, I feel like a lot of these leagues, like NFL, I thought was really interesting that you have the international rights in like several countries. But I think that there's just like, there's questions about the sustainability. Um, and, and I see you talking about, Hey, we got to be profitable and stuff, but just one thing that's probably gonna help push it there as much as any strategy, like adding pay-per-view or something, it's just going to be just having like the biggest and the best sports. So are you yeah, chasing think, stuff down? What are you trying to do? No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think our strategy is a business I've, I've outlined. It's the destination platform. That's the where, where the, where the business is going. That's the vision for the business product wise and experience wise, clearly market to market, country to country, there's going to be different content. The U S design product is very, very different to, Frankly, every other country we operate in in a, in a proper way. Canada, led by NFL, only place to watch all games, big European soccer package, big multi-sport package. Um, every day of the week, there's uh, lots of different content on ranging from for all different types of sports. In Germany, in Italy, in Spain, in Japan, if we're not the number one sports broadcaster full stop, we are number two or number three. Like we are we're top, top tier sports broadcaster carrying, in most cases, uh, domestic, in all cases, actually, in those four countries, domestic soccer rights uh, exclusively, if not the, every single game, the, the majority of games. So the design product and content offer in different countries is very, very different. The US is a different beast altogether. 
Now, when we entered the market 2018, I think it's fair to say we had ambitions at that time to go and have a broader content offer. Now, we learned on, on, on the job, we learned that perhaps uh, we need to have a more phased approach. What I'm very focused on right now in the US, and I oversee a few of our markets, including Canada, the UK, and, uh, and the US. In the US, talk about sustainability, it would not be sustainable for our business right now to clumsily go and buy for a huge amount of money a, a, a package of rights that we're not set up to maximize um, and optimize from a monetization perspective. What is sustainable for our business in the US right now is to continue optimizing our boxing proposition, to start blending in quickly more and more crossover boxing events. The, the X series is our, is our venture in celebrity fighting. Those two things together will take this business very, very quickly into increasingly profitable waters in the US. That's sustainable. Profitability is sustainable. Uh, as we get to that position, as we move deeper and deeper into a profitable place, which we are doing, uh, we'll, we'll start looking at broad opportunities to broaden our wings. And we'll, we'll make announcements soon about, you know, a new package of rights, not hundreds and hundreds of million dollars of rights investment, but, but new packages that expand our content offer in a sensible, sustainable way. Um, I, could set, I could sit here uh, disingenuously if I wanted to and say in five years, we're going to be the number one sports broadcaster in the US. I think our journey in the US is slightly different. What we're judged on is not how many badges we've got on our content page. We're judged on the profitability of our business. And I think we have an opportunity with better management of our boxing business, with better management of our subscription base, with the rollout of pay-per-view, with sensible um, uh, practical use of that on a spare, not sparingly, not, not every day of the week. The rollout increasingly of our X series product, our celebrity fighting product, is to start attracting more and more and more people more regularly to the zone. And when we do monetize them in a more effective way, we also have the opportunity to bring in the additional sort of um, elements of the fandom wheel that I mentioned earlier, and, and, and adding that to what we do as a as a, as a platform. So um, the zone globally, destination brand, multi sport buying lots and lots of different content in lots of different sports. The US, we have a specific strategy that's, that's successful for us now. We're well established within that. And it's, a, it's a big niche. Boxing's a niche, but it's a big one. Yeah. It's a passionate, big audience. We're doing a really good job now of monetizing that. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we've, we've focused on that because if we tried to do too much in the US, perhaps maybe like we did when we came in, um, I don't think that would be sustainable. I don't think that would be successful for us. So you can't, you can't uh, pay a billion I'm, annually for NFL right now in the states. I, well, one, the rights aren't available. And, hypothetically, and, and, and hypothetically, hypothetically, I, I, I just, I'm just, I, I don't. I think you've got to look at what's best for both sides. Would having the NFL rights exclusive on his own right now be great? Sure, be great. Do I think it's possible or the best thing for our business uh, right now for, for sustainable growth right now? No, I don't. I think we're focused where we should be focused, building a successful business. Is it going to stay like that forever? Absolutely not. Well, they'll be open in 2030. They'll be open in 2030. Yeah, well, are you are you going to buy the NBA rights in 2024? Well, I don't think so. And I think if we're still sat here in 2030, Ernest, I think our, our ability to have a few drinks and then go to work the next day would be even worse than it is now, right? So maybe we'll have that conversation in a decade's time or seven years' time. But all joking aside, I'm I'm very, very happy with where the business is right now in the U.S., there's, there's still things you've got to do to make it more effective. Can we optimize it further? Absolutely. Um, are, are there new products to build into the zone experience? Absolutely. Is there new content to bring on in the US and in North America uh, gradually? Yes. We're going we're gonna to make the smart, measured decisions around all of that in a, in a calculated, prioritized way when it's right for our business. Uh, right now, we're very happy where we are and we're, we're, we're working to optimize it. How much of a threat is piracy with like eating into that? Like, you know, I know that we could probably talk for an hour about that and I do want to wrap up here, but like I've heard at least, you know, from colleagues of yours that it is something that you are also passionate about or have a lot of thoughts about how to contain that. Um, like, can it really like ruin the business and you have to keep a tight no. leash on it? No, I don't think it's going to ruin the business at all. I, I think it's, 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 it's a challenge uh, that every broadcaster in the industry faces. I think, digital broadcast more than others. Um, yeah, I think we're increasingly adept at, at managing it. Um, I think it, it's clearly, especially as the younger generation come in, um, they're more 
savvy digitally than their parents were, which means they're probably more likely to do it. But I think, um, you know, obviously, ultimately, the, the best form of attack, sorry, the best form of defense against piracy is attack. And you attack with the quality of your product experience. And that is why, you know, Spotify did it with Napster. I was Napster about to say, died. Man. Napster died I, I was the Spotify number became. one. I don't want to like let the Homeland no, the Security, F- whoever FBI, FBI figure it out. <laughs> but no, but no, you know, yeah. like everyone in the states in my generation, you know, I, I went like a decade without buying any music, except for people I really wanted to support because that was always mm-hmm. like fun. But um, I have uh, since 2011, since Spotify debuted in the states, I have not listened to any music that was acquired illegally because it became a point even there's been records that Mm. leaked a few days early and i said "Mm, i would rather just wait to listen on spotify in a few days because it's a better service it's a better i don't have to go and unzip and do all this weird torrent stuff and so i feel you might just put out a good product and and that'll keep you guys safe so so that is why the destination is a nice sort of wrap up i think for the interview it comes back to what i said at the start about the, the destination if you build an incredible product experience, I mean, I'm on Spotify 50 times a day. I, li- I wake up in the morning. I have it when I'm in the shower, on the way to work, at work, when I'm trying to go to sleep, I have sleep music. I use it relentlessly. I'll be in there most loyal. It's a fantastic, fantastic product. It's my favorite digital product, apart from the zone, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I want to build, we want to build the zone as the sporting equivalent for that, make it a destination platform where everything around sport you do, you use it all day, you get all your sports. Um, every every element of your sports fandom is served by by the zone. And that's what we're going to build. And that will ultimately make the, the threat of piracy far less um, interesting to consumers because they'll want to watch it on the zone in the same way that you want to listen to music on Spotify. Yeah, well, man, I appreciate you uh, just opening up with me here I, I you know we got we talked for like a few minutes in vegas so it's like really cool to have like such a thorough conversation um you know high hopes and and best of luck for where the zone is headed i think having a smart guy like yourself uh in a driver's seat in a lot of ways is is gonna help you all realize uh the ambitions that you have and thanks for coming and, and telling me a bit about yourself and how you plan to make that a reality I appreciate it. I appreciate what you do with the show. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Hey, everyone. This is Owen Poindexter, senior writer at Front Office Sports and host of The Newsroom. The Newsroom is where the Front Office Sports team of writers, reporters, and analysts break down what they're seeing in the sports economy and give their unfiltered takes on what's really going on behind the scenes. We're taking on the stories behind the stories on topics like the World Cup, live golf, major media deals, college sports, and every other major touch point where sports is impacting the rest of the world. Join the newsroom every week for a look at the trends, power players, and scandals shaping the sports industry. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Joe for coming out. I really enjoy talking to him in general. I've really been enjoying the conversations on this show. You know, one thing that I feel really grateful for is to just understand what really makes these companies run. I remember the first time I watched something on Zone years ago and to see how they've evolved, to see how they've become one of the leading broadcasters in the world, and then to sit down and talk with their North American CEO and really understand the vision that goes into that. Uh, you know, it's something I don't take for granted. And especially, you know, I hope it's useful to, to learn more about these people, to learn more about their journey, you know, how they got to where they're at in life. And uh, maybe we can all compare notes. We can get inspired. You know, whatever it is, whatever you take away from the show, I appreciate the support. I appreciate you listening. Make sure that you are listening to the newsroom, the lead off to other awesome front office sports podcasts that, you know, satisfy your audio needs in a in a different way um we are going to be back next wednesday with another guest i'm gonna just tell you right now this whole next run of guests so i'll be close out 2022 heading into 2023 it's gonna be very special and i'll leave it there peace